I V M. June 2018 was a big month for environmentalism in India, spurred into action by the sheer suffocating burden of waste created each year. The government of Maharashtra implemented a ban on all single-use plastics in the state. In the same month, Prime Minister Narendra Modi pledged to eliminate all single-use plastic in the country by 2022 with an immediate ban in urban Delhi. These were big, bold statements to target a massive problem, coming on the heels of global popular movements to reduce waste in our landfills and our oceans. And many of these movements seem to have found their focal point in a particularly visible culprit, the plastic straw. From Starbucks to street vendors, businesses all over the world are commendably transitioning away from single-use plastics, particularly the straw. It's all very encouraging and a necessary step to building a better planet. But when you analyze the problem, you can't help but wonder if you're overlooking some of the biggest challenges for our oceans. Bloomberg News estimates that plastic straws account for only 0.03% of total plastic ocean waste by mass, while another study showed that fully 46% of debris in the oceans comes from a rather unintuitive source, abandoned fishing equipment. It's a startling fact and one which underscores a startling truth. Seafood supply is perhaps even more of a challenge than other terrestrial kinds of meat. The health and welfare of billions of people and indeed the stability of life on Earth, depends on vibrant and robust oceans. Global demand for seafood is projected to increase by nearly 30% within a decade. Yet, over 90% of wild fisheries are fished at maximum capacity, classified as overfished, or are already depleted. Across the globe, overfishing has pushed many species to the brink of extinction and driven many ocean ecosystems to the point of collapse. Meanwhile, seafood supply represents huge challenges for traceability or knowing where your food is coming from. A 2016 review of more than 200 studies from 55 countries found that at least one in five seafood products is mislabeled, which means that bluefin tuna or beautiful Atlantic salmon you think you're eating is actually something else. Some countries like Canada had as high as 44% mislabeling. It's clear that seafood supply chain has a major visibility issue. And no matter which way you look at it, for ocean ecosystems, consumers, or even the laborers working within that opaque supply chain, seafood is a problem and a complex one. Accelerating the commercialization of plant-based and cultivated seafood products that compete on taste, price, and accessibility and nutritional quality with their ocean-derived counterparts should comprise a core component of the global new protein strategy. It wouldn't be too dramatic to say that it could mean the difference between maintaining the vibrancy and vitality of our oceans and global collapse. Today's guest on Feeding 10 Billion can shed some light on the path to ensuring a sustainable supply of seafood through plant-based and cultivated production methods. Jen Lamy leads the Good Food Institute Sustainable Seafood Initiative, where she's focused on building a multidisciplinary global team focused on solving seafood supply. She has a background in environmental economics, sustainable food systems, and environmental management, and adeptly works with our teams across countries, including GFI India's, to lay the foundation for delicious, affordable, nutritious, plant-based and cultivated seafood. I'm Varun Deshpande, Managing Director at the Good Food Institute India. And I'm Ramya Ramurthy, the Communication Specialist at the Good Food Institute India. You're listening to Feeding 10 Billion. Jen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for calling in at the crack of dawn in the US. Now, we've all seen that image of that cute little seahorse wrapped around a discarded earbud and those monstrous floating garbage piles in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And this emphasis that we constantly see on the 8 million metric tons that we discard annually into the ocean of plastic waste or the fact that plastic will soon outnumber fish by weight by 2015 our oceans is often what captures popular imagination. But Isn't it true that at the same time, our fish stock is also depleting pretty rapidly because of overfishing and rising water temperatures? So could you tell us a bit about how are people currently trying to solve these problems? And what are the different approaches to sort of get fish on people's plates like aquaculture and deep sea fishing? That's a really good question. Um, And you're right to bring up in the 
the intro, that sort of um, distinction between the fact that we pay a lot of attention to these plastic soda bottles and straws and bags that we see in images of um, the Pacific garbage patch. But we know that, you know, almost half of that plastic is from discarded fishing gear. That's what we call ghost gear. So anything that's abandoned or discarded or lost um, in the fishing process. And those, I should mention that gear, it's not just that there's plastic sitting in the ocean, but it's, you know, having these entanglement results and the, a lot of incidents directly with marine life as well. So um, that on its own is a challenge. Um, but as you mentioned, you know, fishing itself um, has a huge direct impact. We take one to three trillion individual fish out of the ocean um, every year. That's based on FAO tonnage statistics combined with the estimated mean weights of fish. So there's you know, it's a huge amount of fish that are taken directly out of the ocean um, without even taking into account the, you know, damages we're doing indirectly in a lot of different ways. And there are sort of two main strategies that have been employed so far to sort of ensure the sustainability of our seafood supply. One is fishery management. So just making sure that we are taking a low enough number and from the right fisheries to try to mitigate the, you know, impacts of overfishing um, on our long-term supplies and then there's been this simultaneous effort to grow aquaculture and in some cases to try and grow aquaculture in a sustainable way. But both of those methods have really brought about challenges um, just in terms of the way the seafood industry is set up, the way that we're trying to grow this um, so fast in order to feed our growing population. Um, and so we really think that we need another option and another source of seafood. Um, and so that's why we at GFI are looking towards both plant-based um, and cultivated seafood to really ramp up supply without the issues that are implicit in both aquaculture and wild-caught seafood. So could you make it clear what aquaculture is? Because many people don't know. Aquaculture is just the farming of fish. So instead of going out um, and catching fish from our oceans, it's in any way, and there are a lot of different ways that you can do it. You can do it um, right off the coast or even on land. There's a move right now to push aquaculture farming um, a little bit further off the coast. But really, it's just any time that you are farming fish for consumption. Um, it also, you know, can largely encompass all um, sort of non-fish farming too in the ocean. So a lot of the, um, you know, seaweed production that goes on. But when I refer to it, I'm generally referring to raising fish for food in the same way that we raise livestock and animals on land for food. And to be clear, like that generates a ton of agricultural runoff. So it generates a lot of waste. Uh, and that's going to be a, yep. a, a huge problem moving forward, right? So I think one of the things that that people don't realize is we often focus on terrestrial solutions to climate change uh, in terms of land use, water use, other resources. And that, that makes sense. But of course, the oceans mean a great deal to the future of the planet as well. Could you tell us a little bit, just in a big zoomed out way, why the oceans are even important? For people that are entering the conversation late, why are the oceans important to the vitality of the earth and generally to climate change? Yeah, so, I mean, we can say this just as we need a healthy ocean to help mitigate climate change, but we also need to slow climate change um, in order to maintain a healthy ocean. And they're really inextricably linked. And I think that link is just starting to come out in um, both sort of the ocean space and in the climate space, which is great. But in the last um, 200 or so years, the ocean has observed a third of the CO2 that's produced by human activities um, and something like 90% of the extra heat from climate change has been absorbed by the ocean. So it's really been mitigating these impacts, but also um, there have been major implications already for marine life. So both from warming and populations having to move, but also CO2 itself in our ocean um, really has this direct impact through ocean acidification, which people sometimes call global warming's evil twin. Um, and so our oceans are now something about 25% more acidic than um, before the industrial revolution. You know, we need to mitigate climate change in order to make sure that our oceans are able to, you know, maintain this vitality over the um, coming decades and centuries. And the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, published a special report in September that was focused on oceans and ice. So there was a lot in this report, but um, one of the takeaways that I think is important to mention is basically just that the climate impact on the oceans is happening faster than we expected. And oceans are becoming more acidic. Sea level rise is accelerating, um, primarily due to melting in Greenland and our Antarctic ice sheets. And marine species are moving from the equator towards the poles um, as the waters warm. So um, really, the you know, the link is something that we can't forget about. And we can't separate um, the issues of ocean health from climate. Um, and while 
there are all these impacts of land-based agriculture on the ocean, um, we also need to keep in mind that, you know, the way that we use our oceans and the way that we create fish um, is both a cause and um, also affected by how we handle our climate crisis. So one of the figures that really shocked me was that one third of our fish stock are currently being depleted faster than they can be replenished. So apparently another 60% are fished at the maximum sustainable level. So now if you're doing the math, that just leaves about 7% of fish stocks that are adequate. So can you paint us a picture of what the consequences this has in terms of sustainability, not just for the wildlife extension crisis or the climate change crisis that you pointed out, but also food shortage and precarious livelihoods of fisher folk that depend on it versus this more sort of complex fishing industry, right? Of course, that sort of first 30% number that you said, um, that's a huge proportion of fixed fish stocks that are already being exploited um, or overexploited. So that's really problematic on its own. But I think that 60% number um, where we're fishing at our maximum um, sustainable capacity is also really important. So when we talk about a maximum sustainable yield, that means, you know, the maximum catch that we can extract from a fish or you can refer to other populations in this way in the long term to really maintain sort of the overall population numbers. So technically, we could keep extracting fish from those fisheries at that rate um, and have populations remain fairly steady um, if you take into account careful management uh, based on um, sort of annual fluctuations and population dynamics. But the problem there really comes in two other forms. Um, one is that we know demand for seafood is going to continue to rise. So we have populations rising, incomes rising. Some estimates put us at that 30% increase in demand just by um, the end of the next decade. Mm. And so with only 7% of fisheries underfished, there's just not room to meet demand um, with wild-caught fishing. And at the same time, that number of sort of seeing our oceans producing about the same amount of seafood every year does not take into account where that fishing is happening. And fishing has really moved further into the high seas as coastal fisheries have been depleted. So as many as 40% of the world's fishing grounds are now um, in water deeper than 200 meters. So really far away from shore um, where it's harder to regulate. So that's where we get a lot of illegal, unreported and um, unregulated or this IUU fishing, which is ripe with social issues. And we also get more fuel use and bigger vessels being used mm. to get further out to the ocean. So we have these really um, sort of cycles going on where not only are we um, fishing further away from shore, but we're you know, really getting to the end of the stock as we kind of go out um, further from our coastal areas. Yeah, and you mentioned that the the global demand for seafood is rising pretty rapidly, right? And we've talked about this, Jen. Much mm -hmm. of this is being driven by lower income and middle income countries now consuming more and more seafood and terrestrial animals. So could you characterize for me the size of this problem? So let's say relative to the terrestrial animals like cows and pigs and chickens, uh, how much fish are people eating and how complex is this problem? It's extremely complex um, and it's a you know massive scale of a problem. So globally, humans eat somewhere around 180 million metric tons. Um, I think that was the last estimate a couple of years ago. Within the last few years, the global per capita fish consumption um, surpassed 20 kilograms per capita. And so far, we've been able to meet that demand with this increased supply and this really rapid ramping up um, of aquaculture. But um, even, you know, as that happens, we have these sustainability issues that come into play. We run out of sort of space to site aquaculture, and it really becomes this, you know, cyclical problem of having to um, sort of create newer and less sustainable systems to kind of supply that amount. And, you know, that's a huge issue from a nutritional standpoint um, with so many people relying on seafood as a source of not only protein, but omega-3s and several micronutrients. And it's a problem for, you know, the sort of subsistence fishers of the world whose, you know, stocks are completely depleted by these larger industrial vessels. You know, we really need another way to get those nutrients to people since this system is not really working. So one of the things that a colleague told me today is uh, when we talk about fish, uh, we refer to them in tons, like in volume, we actually don't refer to them in numbers. Whereas when we talk mm -hmm. about terrestrial meat or animals, there's always a sense of how many, exactly how many animals are being pushed through that uh, factory farm system, right? And traditionally also, when we think of meat, especially in India, you know, there's a focus on chicken or mutton, which is consumed quite 
popularly but fish or seafood is not seen or viewed the same way like for instance bengalis who eat a lot of seafood often justify their fish consumption by calling it fruit of the sea uh, so this sort of minimizes the way you look at it as meat in the same way as you do terrestrial meat so does that work as a challenge when we're trying to sensitize consumers to the perils of sort of ignoring the sea as we try to create the food system of the future it's a huge challenge um so that number that i cited that we you know take 1 to 3 trillion um we kill 1 to 3 trillion fish per year that's obviously a huge range there's a lot of uncertainty around you know just how many animals it is because we think about fish and seafood in terms of tonnage as you mentioned and you're completely right that seafood is not typically seen as meat um i think that's a pretty global trend here in the us consumers are often switching from red meat or poultry even to fish because they see it as a healthier um and even a more sustainable in their view option fish and shellfish are often seen as like the climate friendly protein um because it's a lot harder to quantify the greenhouse gas emissions associated with their production and also it's we just see their production um less overall so we don't really think about their environmental impacts as clearly and they're really because they're not seen as animals um consumers are you know much less likely to consider something like marine animal welfare when making food decisions or as they are when they you know consider terrestrial um animal welfare and to an extent that you know that sustainability message with regards to overfishing environmental risks aquaculture other issues might end up being more important in getting consumers um to at least try plant-based or cultivated seafood um than on the land-based side it also means i think that these products have an even higher um sort of threshold for success so they need to have this perfect sensory profile perfect mm-hmm. nutritional profile the price the convenience all needs to be there um in order to you know get consumers to even try them because they just don't see a reason to um try plant-based or cultivated seafood otherwise um because we're so removed from the system so removed from fish and shellfish as animals um so i think there are a lot of reasons why that makes you know the production of good products even more important in this case and i think i mean that's definitely a huge piece of it and on the other side of that as you mentioned earlier there's also a livelihood piece and even the industrial fishing system competing with subsistence farmers for their stock so one shocking fact is that over 800 million people are at risk of malnutrition globally if fish populations continue to decline So if you couple this with the fact that the growth of fish farming is continuing extremely rapidly with increased demand for 17 countries uh I think something like 170 countries will be left with substantial unmet demand. So we had Sandhya Shriram on our podcast earlier in the season and one of the reasons she started a company to cultivate shrimp from cells is she saw firsthand how awful the conditions of shrimp farms were in terms of antibiotic use and what they were fed. which again is a testament to the industrial system right illegal fishing even enslaves migrant workers in the south china sea which is what you were saying earlier about illegal fishing having all sorts of human rights implications so if more than one third of all fish that are caught around the world now are caught illegally can we simultaneously improve all of these things production methods livelihoods and still keep all the costs down because clearly there are some supply chain implications for the cost of this and that's why companies are using these methods So the seafood industry is, you know, notoriously opaque, which means that, you know, companies can really get away with cutting corners. Um so that's everything from this illegal fishing, but also as you mentioned these labor issues in aquaculture. Um there have been some sort of exposés, investigative journalism um in the last several years really showing the terrible working conditions um uh, which have, you know, of course, more, you know, in addition to having to do with the production system itself, there are governance issues um and other social issues at play, but really it's a difficult industry to grow fast and still do in a responsible way. And so as companies are sort of getting away with things um it also means that consumers are less likely to even know about or be concerned about these issues um because the industry is so complex it's so hard to you know understand exactly what's going on um even consumers who are interested in where their seafood comes from and who want to buy um you know the most responsible the most sustainable products have a hard time figuring that out even with um a pretty big effort in several places to put labels and certifications on seafood um i think that not only poses a challenge but i think it also really really paves the way for why we need plant based and cultivated seafood as i sort of mentioned before it's consumers just have very little incentive to sort of give up what they're eating because they don't understand issues with it and so the more that we're able to you know combine this information sharing with 
a production of a you know viable alternative, the better. And and I should mention also that you know these issues with aquaculture are in no way you know restricted to Asia. You know we've just saw problems in the U.S. about a month ago with、uh, salmon hatchery and more on the sort of marine annual. Animal abuse side of that, but、um, still, it's just it's a global problem as we try to grow a new system of farming really fast、um, to meet demand. And you know, of course, we want to meet demand,、um, but it's just it's really challenging to do that in a responsible way. That's a lot of food for thought. On that note, we'll take a short break, but come back for more conversation with Jen on feeding ten billion. Hey everybody! Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please make sure you do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Also, like to thank Intel and Storytel for supporting us this month. Want to welcome a brand new show onto the network? It's called Peak Planet. It's hosted by research fellow and engineer Karthik Ganeshan. In every episode, Karthik discusses sustainability issues that affect Indians through evidence-backed information. In the first season, he dives deep into air pollution and the discourse around it. I think this is especially important given the situation across the country these days. On Cyrus says, Cyrus is joined by print and TV journalist and founder of fact-checking platform Boom, Govind Athiraj. He talks to Cyrus about the importance of fact-check. In today's scenario, the birth of the India Fact Check quiz and poses some sample questions to Cyrus himself. The Filter Coffee Podcast is back with freshly brewed episodes. This week, Karthik talks to Senior VP of Marketing, Digital, and Communications at Penguin Random House India, Neeti Kumar. Neeti explains Penguin's unique editorial system, the challenges faced by publishers regarding piracy, and her take on the digital revolution. On Mr. and Mrs. Binge Watch, Janice and Anirudh are back to share their love for the true crime stories. This week, they talk about the hit Netflix show Mind Hunter. On advertising is dead. Varun is joined by the CEO of Scoop Oop, Satvik Mishra. They talk about how Satvik became an accidental entrepreneur. On Simplify, Chuck and Narayan Simplify conglomerates like Luxottica, Unilever, and yeah, even IBM Podcast. Yeah, we're a conglomerate. We're a big, big conglomerate. This week on Know Your Kanu, Number is joined by Pawan Kakade, partner at Price Waterhouse Coopers. They talk about the taxation system in India and topics around economy, startups, compliance regimes, and even more. And with that, let's get you on with your show. Welcome back to Feeding Ten Billion. Now, Jen. We've been talking about the opaqueness of the fishing industries, but the other aspect that we haven't really gone into as much is that you know while the fish we do capture more ethically or farm, or even if they're from underfish stock, they could actually be pretty harmful for human health. Usually, they contain toxic concentrations of pollutants, heavy metals, and it's led to infant mortality through exposure to things like mercury. So apparently, upwards of three lakh newborns in the U.S. alone are exposed to Toxic levels of mercury in the womb each year. So, can you still, at this point in time, want to eat ethically and still eat conventional seafood anymore, even if it's not farmed and even if it's wild or sourced in a better way through any traditional means of fishing? There isn't really full consensus on sort of how the risks of contamination of seafood should be weighed against, you know, nutritional benefits, namely the omega three fatty acids. But evidence is really Pointing towards contamination becoming an increasingly significant issue in our seafood supply. So, you know, for one, there was research just this past summer、uh, that really demonstrated an increased concentration of mercury in seafood、um, that's projected both with climate change and with overfishing. So, we expect the concentration、um, within a given product to be higher with both of those trends continuing.、Um, and they did that through a lot of sophisticated modeling. But also, in addition, there are new and not well researched at this point pollutants that are getting in seafood and that are starting to get attention. And one that I like to mention is microplastics in seafood. I'd say in general, you know, they microplastics make their way into our food in a lot of ways. Seafood is only one,、um, but we still have really, really low amount of understanding of what they do to humans.、Um, and there's Anything I think an average person consumes anywhere between something like forty and fifty thousand particles、um, of plastic each year, mostly through their diet. And of course, you know, toxicity of different sources of plastic particles will differ, and、um, different microplastics will make their way into human bodies in many ways. But marine animal wildlife is a major source. So、um, I think if we want to, you know, continue eating seafood and getting benefits, we really need to make a concerted push to advance.、Um, Both plant-based and cultivated seafood, because there are just so many complications in the production system that lead to these dangers. Jen, specifically talking about Asia, something like eighty percent of fish here are farmed. This basically means that the demand for those apex predators, the huge fish like tuna, is challenging because they're massively resource inefficient to farm. Right, that's a species that you simply cannot farm.、Mm-hmm. 
So are there ways in which plant-based and cultivated seafood can fix those types of problems and create a whole slew of opportunities for consumers to access those fish now? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's, I mean, exactly the same kind of inefficiency problem that we have when we talk about land-based animals. You know, fish and shellfish um, do tend to have a better feed conversion ratio, so they need fewer calories in per calorie out than the land-based animals, but they still use food to grow bones and eyeballs and scales and other body parts that, you know, humans don't eat or, you know, they use fuel to swim around. Um, and so this makes the production process inherently inefficient, um, just like land-based animals. And also really important to note is that for the most part, farmed fish are still being caught, um, fed wild-caught fish meal and fish oil. There are a lot of people working on alternative feeds, both plant-based and um, in some cases there are, you know, innovative ways to use new algae types um, to feed fish. But really the vast majority of farmed seafood is still fed by fish meal and fish oil. And it's actually estimated that about one third of all the fish caught globally is forage fish, like sardines and anchovies. And 95% of that is processed into fish meal and fish oil, um, which is used not just for aquaculture, although it's about 75% for aquaculture. Um, and then, you know, the remaining for farming on land. Um, so really a huge issue with, you know, the aquaculture industry still being so linked to wild caught fishing. Um, and with this, these aren't like closed loop systems by in any form. And there was, there was actually just a report about a month or two ago that looked at the supply chains in India, Vietnam, and I believe West Africa for fish meal and fish oil that end up in the farm seafood and European retail chains. And they found mm -hmm. that most of the fish meal and fish oil that was being used to feed that supply was really having a detrimental impact on fish stocks and also compromising food security by taking up those forage fish. So it's really a parallel story to what's happening on land, but with some extra complications due to this, you know, complicated wild caught fishing industry. I feel like we've had a barrage of fairly like depressing news. So I want to get into something that could be quite promising. So we've talked about all these barriers to sustainable seafood initiatives. And, you know, how are we at the Good Food Institute looking at solving some of these issues, you know, whether it's identifying various species or studying extrusion techniques, you know, in terms of what, what it takes to replicate fish tissue the same way, or even creating flavors of seafood the same way. The, like the real thing in plant-based and cultivated meat products. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff going on. Um, we at GFI are focused a lot on sort of the research side and, you know, really trying to lower the barriers to entry um, for new companies to come into this space and really try to supply this need. The interesting thing about seafood is that, you know, with the issues in surrounding wild-caught fish and the fact that we are right up against our limit there, we really might be able to see these products compete on price um, more quickly than other products. So a lot of exciting stuff happening there. Um, some of the you know basic research on the technical side is not readily available. Um, so for example, the you know fresh primary cell isolate for terrestrial farmed animals can often be obtained through partnerships with slaughterhouses or veterinary medicine um, institutes or university animal science departments. But those departments often do not work with marine species. So the majority of fish slaughter occurs at the site of harvest rather than in a centralized slaughter facility. We don't have access to that kind of information. So we are working on lowering barrier to entry for new companies and really building this space through open access research on the technical side. So hopefully we'll be able to provide some of those resources to companies and really get this space to expand rapidly. You know, the industry is... A really complicated one, as I've mentioned, you know, it's a little bit more segmented than land-based animal production. And we have, you know, these two competing and in many ways linked industries of aquaculture and wild caught fishing. So we're really also trying to figure out how we bring this industry with us in sort of a transformation and in, not in a sort of disruptive way, but really making use of the distribution channels and the um, supply knowledge and really the taste and sensory sort of attributes of conventional seafood products in order to, you know, make the exact same products that consumers want in this new way. So there's a lot, a lot to be done on sort of both the research and this, you know, industry engagement side to um, build the industry. But we're seeing um, a lot of great progress. The companies in the space are all um, making incredible progress and headway um, in developing products and getting tastings and starting to, you know, raise really significant funding. So um, there's a lot to be excited about. 
I totally agree. And I think so what Jen mentioned earlier about the the cell lines, uh, those would be cell lines as a technology element for cultivated meat, right? So you take cells of the animal that you want to grow. So in this case, if it's if it's pomfret or bombil or bluefin tuna or any of those fish, you would hope that in a couple of years, these cell lines would be available to researchers and to companies to take and make products from them. And one of the things that we've been working on in the India team is looking at the international regulations for, let's say, a cell bank is established in Norway, for example. Would we still be able to access those cells in India? Or would we have to build up local infrastructure? And I think we're leaning towards the latter answer because there are complications of transporting these things internationally. But I'm certainly extremely optimistic that we can make this a pretty thriving ecosystem, even in seafood. Uh, there are several barriers and challenges to that, as Jen was saying, but we remain hugely optimistic. And on that note, I have one final question for you, Jen, which is actually the theme of our podcast. And this is what we usually end our podcasts on. Um, what's your vision for how we're going to eat in the year 2050? How soon before we can feast on some cultivated fish or plant-based seafood that resembles a real deal? So, And what are the companies to watch out for in this space? I think right now we are at the beginning of a huge, huge shift in the seafood industry. And I really do think that in 2050, we'll see a really significant portion of seafood consumed all around the world being either plant-based or cultivated or both. And that's not just because I imagine these products will be available and taste great and be nutritious. Um, I think by the middle of the century, we could see a real shift in relative prices. So as demand increases in wild-caught fish, which is already facing its upper limit, We'll likely see huge price increases as, you know, supply is not able to keep up with demand. And based on projections, uh, aquaculture is not expected to continue growing at the rate it has grown and will not really be able to keep with, up with demand at low prices either. So in order to really be buying affordable seafood, consumers will have to be looking to plant-based and cultivated options. And um, it's the work of a, a lot of forward-thinking companies and investors and researchers and entrepreneurs and others, I think, that um, will get us to having plant-based and cultivated seafood markets really, really ready to supply that growing global demand. In terms of companies to watch in this space, there are aren't that many. And I honestly think we should be watching all of them. Um, each of them has their own story, their own focus. Um, and I, I really think that everyone has something to contribute. Obviously, both Shuk and Avant, um, Avant Meats in, the, in Asia will have, you know, this advantage with their regulatory markets. But I think, you know, we're seeing really good moves out of companies like Blue Nalu here in the States, who has already publicized plans for commercialization, including these massive facility designs that really show how they can um, contribute meaningfully to our supply of seafood um, all over the world. And we're also seeing, you know, Finless Foods and Wild Type have their, their own unique focuses and have made it clear that they're um, really making progress towards an end product that consumers will love. And I also don't think we should be dismissing the plant-based side at this point. Um, you know, especially on the sensory side, we hear a lot about how Good Catch has gotten this, you know, really well-deserved attention for the work they've done in achieving this awesome sensory profile of their products with a really simple and easily understandable list of ingredients, um, which gives them a huge boost. Um, and then we have, you know, other players like Ocean Hugger who are, um, using, you know, these whole vegetable products and they continue to gain traction in food service. So I think there's there's a lot to be excited about and a lot of companies to watch. A uh, really recent development was that a U.S.-based conventional seafood company, um, a small company called the Van Cleve Seafood Company, just announced that they're leveraging their seafood know-how to really bring a new plant-based line of products to the market. So really excited to, you know, watch the industry, um, the conventional seafood industry on its own as it tra starts to pick up traction in the same way that the um, conventional meat industry has started to look at these products. And I think we're going to see some really big moves in the coming years. Um, and then, you know, within 30 years, have a really, really significant market for plant-based and cultivated seafood. Yeah. And I think Tyson Foods also just made an investment in a company, right? Yeah, they invested in New Wave, which is based here in the U.S. and is doing uh, plant-based shrimp and other products. That's hugely exciting. Okay, Jen, thank it you is. so much for being on Feeding 10 Billion. Thank you both for having me. Northern Harvest Sea Farms is a Canadian division of the Norwegian salmon fishing giant, Mowi. Last week, in October 2019, Northern Harvest made a shocking announcement. A month earlier, they said, they had lost 2.6 million Atlantic salmon, about 5,000 metric tons, from their aquaculture operations on the coast of Canada. 
the fish had died due to a few weeks of excessively warm waters in early September. After a month of cleaning up dead fish in Fortune Bay, contracting a large number of divers and vessels to assist, the managing director of the company said they had finished 87% of the task. I can't make my point more forceful than the statement he made. So I will quote directly. The salmon mortalities comprise approximately half of all northern harvest fish in the water. Half of the entire company's inventory, gone. And this is what we're faced with, an unreliable supply of protein leading to astronomically high waste and loss. If we're going to feed 10 billion in 2050, we need more reliable systems. If we're going to have bluefin tuna or cod or pomfret or bombil for everybody, investing in the diversification of seafood supply is a no-brainer. As the advantages of plant-based and cultivated seafood over industrial fishing and aquaculture continue to become apparent, we're convinced that a vibrant ecosystem employing millions and providing many more with good food will emerge. But we need to do the work to get there first. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting shows on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or ivmpodcasts.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am at Varun D7 on Twitter and at Varun5 on Instagram. Come ask me why. And you can find me on Instagram as Dithering Phenambulist and on Twitter as Cryptic Caprice. Please don't ask me why. You've been listening to the second to last episode of the current run of Feeding 10 Billion. We have another scintillating episode coming up next week. And then we're diving deep into the holiday season. If you're going to miss us, let us know. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Pesa Pesa, a show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. robo advisory, startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM Podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have. Did you know that Parsis in Mumbai, instead of being left at the Tower of Silence after they die, are now cremated? And why? Because a cow fell sick in the early 1990s. Did you know that the smog in Delhi is caused by something that farmers in Punjab do and that there's no way to stop them? Did you know that there wasn't one gas tragedy in Bhopal, but three? One of them was seen, but two were unseen. Did you know that many well-intentioned government policies hurt the people they're supposed to help? Why was demonetization a bad idea? How should GST have been implemented? Why are all our politicians so corrupt when not all of them are bad people? I'm Amit Verma, and in my weekly podcast, The Seen and the Unseen, I take a shot at answering all these questions and many more. I aim to go beyond the scene and show you the unseen effects of public policy and private action. I speak to experts on economics, political philosophy, cognitive neuroscience and constitutional law so that the insights can blow not only my mind, but also yours. The Seen and the Unseen releases every Monday. So do check out the archives and follow the show at seenunseen.in. You can also subscribe to The Seen and the Unseen on whatever podcast app you happen to prefer.